Yumi and the Nightmare Painter by Brandon Sanderson is the latest of the secret projects and one that I simultaneously read with A Wizard's Guide to Surviving Medieval England. Handbook! I knew there was something wrong, stop commenting it. And while I do want to eventually talk about my praises and criticisms of A Frugal Wizard's Handbook, I was so excited to talk about Yumi and the Nightmare Painter, I wanted to just give it its own dedicated video because I think this is a gorgeous book that surpassed my expectations, even though I went in with high ones due to the amount of hype I'm seeing from Cosmere fans whose opinions I respect. Now, of course, I have criticisms, but I'll just start off this review by saying, I understand why this is now some people's favorite Cosmere book. It's not mine, but it's in the upper echelon. Getting into just base premise without spoilers, this is just initiating incidents, we are introduced to two separate worlds. One with Yumi, where we have a very religious, structured society where Yumi plays a significant spiritual role, and her entire life is devoted to that role. On the other side of the coin, we have the Nightmare Painter, Nikoro, who is just called Painter more often than not, and his life is far less structured. He works as what could be considered a public servant, fighting nightmares by, you guessed it, painting them. Now, he is not particularly great at his job and is mostly a social outcast due to a mistake he made. After a night of nightmare hunting, though, he wakes up connected in some strange way to Yumi, and the two of them, coming from just wildly different walks of life, must figure out how to solve their connection. And this is a really interesting take on a world-hopping type story, and the agency within that world is handed to the person they are not from, resulting in a continual fish-out-of-water story in two different settings. And in terms of the overall vibe of the story, without ever losing its stakes, this might be Brandon Sanderson's most playful book yet. Uh, in terms of his approach to narrative and using a lot of almost unorthodox approaches as an author to communicate theme that I really, really liked. In fact, I found there to be more flavor in this book from Brandon Sanderson as an author than maybe I have come across from him before. If this is what he means by just putting more of himself into his books we've been talking about recently, I'm really excited to see how the Cosmere is going to continue to grow because that continual criticism that Sanderson's prose are lacking I don't find to be present here. I found this to be really enjoyable while not being overly purple, just in terms of there being a bit more of a punch, a pop, than we've seen typically from Sanderson in the past. I have to address a point that I don't think I'm gonna address again in any of the secret projects because I found it to just be true for all of them that are within the Cosmere, because I think this is just true for almost all stories within the Cosmere at this point. Yes. Stuff in here is more enjoyable if you have read Cosmere stories before and are familiar with it. You can still enjoy this without reading the Cosmere. Some things might feel overly convenient. They still even do a little bit if you've read the full Cosmere, but really that just means there's going to be greater rereadability coming back to this story later on. I'm not gonna talk about that again because that's just true for almost any series and or standalone book within the Cosmere and I'm tired of people asking me that. But all right, what is the soul of this story beyond just the raw reciting of the narrative setup. Well, obviously it focuses heavily on the duo approach of having two protagonists hop back and forth between worlds, but it's more than just these individual characters' perspectives. Yumi and the Nightmare Painter is about their existing relationships in their worlds and how culture affects those relationships. Perspective is everything in Yumi and the Nightmare Opinion in my read of it. And I actually found there to be a nice compliment of that with Sanderson playing with language in a way I can't recall him doing before with this kind of like high-low talk that I feel like was executed well enough, but I would have enjoyed adding even a little bit more of that. On a more base level, the structure of this story, I would say, is certainly not reinventing the wheel. If, like me, you're going through this, taking notes on setup and payoff, you'll probably see a lot of elements coming due to this just kind of relying on tried and true formulas on the more outside macro perspective. But that, of course, is not a criticism. We love our familiar formulas and they are what allow certain stories to be extremely cozy to read. It was so cozy until it wasn't. And of course, Sanderson being Sanderson, having the opposite of the Stephen King problem, he delivers an ending that is big and emotionally bombastic. Once we get into the more vague spoiler section, I'll talk about some criticisms I have here, but 
I think this is one of Sanderson's strongest finishes emotionally for a story in a long time. I think that might be my biggest hindsight criticism of Tress and the Emerald Sea. While I still had a great time uh, with its ending, I wasn't as emotional as I certainly was here with Yumi where I genuinely got goosebumps. I would say though the weakest element to Yumi and the Nightmare Painter uh, is probably the characterization of some of the secondary characters from the painter's world where they felt like they were there to fit a certain trope and do a certain thing. And there isn't much nuance to their character provided beyond just what you would expect beyond their physical traits. It's like, oh, big muscly guy, going to act like big, kind-hearted, muscly guy. And it, it was almost jarring seeing some of the characters in this world act the way they did, because this is the most Earth-like world I believe we have seen up until this point within the Cosmere. I'm talking they have a space program and TVs, so very Earth-like, and it's almost jarring to see that put into a culture that is in the same universe as Mistborn. What I love about that though is it plays, I think, very deliberately into the just stark contrast between these two worlds, where one, yes, feels so modern and much more socially relaxed than the other, but that's the point. It even reflects in their technology, the way they interact with one another. One is more modern, loose, open, liberal, while the other is coming across much more conservative in their ways. This is how things are done. And as a reader, watching these cultures play into these characters who have to then experience each other's cultures provides a lot of different flavor that ends up coming together in like a very uh, sweet and salty way. This setting, salty, different, sweet, different, over here, together in their experience, quite nice. I, I guess you could say Yumi and the Nightmare Painter is very, they got their chocolate in my peanut butter. What I'm trying to get at is the combination and utilization of these two different cultures instills a sense of depth into world building that really leans into ideas of how completely different types of pressure on people can result in similar harm. We're all human and there's no broad stroke solutions to any of that. And instead, it's trying to just remind you the best thing you can often do in life is rely on honesty and truth when appropriate and just finding people you can love and rely on, and admitting mistakes. If I had to just boil this book down to two words, you can probably guess the first, perspective, and the second, understanding. Now, one more element that didn't entirely work for me in Yumi and the Nightmare Painter, and I mean that entirely, there certainly were humorous moments that I was laughing at, but the humor that was often from dialogue, I struggled with. Situational humor worked, and the Hoyt element, I'll leave it at that, uh, was certainly funny. I just don't often end up finding uh, Sanderson's more overt intentional jokes delivered from characters to be that good. Although I guess you could just say, I don't find that character funny rather than Sanderson, I don't know. And there's this note from Sanderson at the end of the book where he says this is like his favorite of the secret projects. And I totally understand why. Not only did it allow him to really bring in some fresh elements to the Cosmere as a whole, he seemed to be stretching a little bit. And there was a taste of Sanderson that I find to be so enticing. And there was a taste of Sanderson that I find to be so enticing and I hope to see go and I hope to see stronger going forward. How did I not hear how that phrasing sounded? Okay. And there was a taste of Sanderson that Oh Jesus Christ. And I hope to see Stronger going forward in terms of his prose and personality really coming through. Overall for Yumi and the Nightmare Painter, I'm putting this between an eight to a nine out of 10. It's closer to a nine than not. Uh, and I wanna talk about some very vague spoilers now. It's not anything super serious and I don't think it'll ruin the reading experience, but if you wanna go in totally blind, this is your warning three, two, one. I did forget to say in my original recording that the illustrations throughout are absolutely fantastic. And if you buy special editions for illustrations, these ones are delicious. So, uh, Aliyah Chen, 
Congratulations, these are my favorite illustrations of the secret project so far. I love how Sanderson decided to have these characters come to an understanding of the difference of each other's perspective and not try and downplay those differences, but instead almost bring a manifestation into the story of them with alternative methods of reaching a form of meditation applied to each character. And the solution isn't you need to figure out how I do this. Instead, it's we need to figure out how you ground yourself, how you're able to meditate, relax, clear your mind, or not clear your mind. It's justified in the story and layers scenes with a feeling of intimacy and you end up really appreciating the evolving relationship between these two characters because instead of feeling like compromise, it feels like they're finding ways to complement each other. But all right, getting to final concluding thoughts and gripes that I did have, I feel like Yumi and the Nightmare Painter could have been a bit more of a tragedy and it almost stepped into that. And if it had, this may have been my favorite Cosmere book. I understand that's not necessarily Sanderson's style, but I guess Berserk has just irrevocably changed me. I find so much more meaning in suffering now. And there is a choice at the end to over explain. The book literally stops all narrative flow and funnily explains a lot. And it took me far too out of the narrative. All of that info, in my opinion, could have been more naturally woven into the text, especially if it had just been two characters who are these entities that have this perspective, could have just had a conversation I would have liked more. But I think a lot of people are gonna disagree with me on that and probably enjoy this utilization of a narrator who just tells you stuff. And I still do enjoy this approach throughout the book of kind of having a narrator telling a story with these characters' perspectives. And it's even, of course, again, justified. Just this one utilization went too far for me. And finally, getting into real specifics, but vague still, I like when a character can say a thing that has a meaning, that reveals information, and then once you think about it from that character's perspective, what they are doing is huge. At the end of this though, yes, I was goosebumps and feeling all warm and fuzzy. I can't deny there's certainly still an appeal to that. I'm just leaning more towards tragedy recently, I guess. I will get around to reviewing a, the Frugal Wizard's Handbook to Surviving Medieval England. I just wasn't as excited to review this one, and uh, it'll probably be in a monthly wrap-up I'm working on now. And now, I wanna show off something really special. Hi, my friend Kyle made me a desk, and it's so pretty, I love it so much. And it's got my series logo on it and my channel logo on it. And I just wanted to give a big thank you to Kyle. If you're interested in ordering a piece of furniture, he takes like three clients at a time and I'll have his Instagram page linked down below. Thank you again, Kyle. Thank you for watching this review of Yumi and the Nightmare Painter. Like and subscribe if you have not already and check out the latest episode of Fantasy News if you want to catch up on all things fantastic that have happened in the last week. Oh, right, I need to, my publisher says I need to do this more. Buy my book, Neon Ghost, it's right there, bye.